Today is Monday, January 22nd. I'm Joe Ellison with a look at what's happening in the news. The field of GOP presidential candidates is now down to two after Florida Governor Ron DeSantis officially ended his campaign. The move comes before the Republican primary in New Hampshire Tuesday. DeSantis was expected to fall behind both former President Trump and Nikki Haley. DeSantis made the announcement on X and is now endorsing Trump. Zach Wilcox spoke with a political analyst about the timing of his announcement and what's next for Governor DeSantis. If there was anything I could do to produce a favorable outcome, more campaign stops, more interviews, I would do it. But I can't ask our supporters to volunteer their time and donate their resources if we don't have a clear path to victory. Those campaign stops and interviews have come to an end with Ron DeSantis deciding to suspend his campaign. First Coast News political analyst John Daigle says the timing feels about right. Coming into the fourth quarter of last year, his campaign only had about $5 million on hand, which we assume most of that was spent in Iowa. Despite the campaign throwing just about everything it had at the Iowa caucuses, DeSantis wound up about 30 points shy of Trump. Daigle doubts the suspension coming just two days before the New Hampshire primaries is a coincidence. It's intended to help Trump more than uh, Haley because most of his supporters will go to Trump and will make Trump stronger in the, uh, the primary this week in New Hampshire. Daigle says pulling out this early sets DeSantis up well for a 2028 run because he got out before he needed to sharpen his attack on the former president. Those same Republican primary voters who are uh, just unwaveringly behind former President Trump are the same voters he would need in 2028 or 32 or, or anywhere going forward. DeSantis' second term as Florida's governor runs through 2026, and Daigle points out he has a supermajority in the state House and Senate to help build his platform. He can really do whatever he wants in Florida, which is a very nice position for him to be in, do whatever he wants for the next three years and help position himself really strongly for 2028. Down here in Florida, we will continue to show the country how to lead. Two U.S. Navy SEALs who went missing at sea earlier this month are now presumed dead. It happened off the coast of Somalia on January 11th. The SEALs disappeared while attempting to board a ship to search for Iranian weapons. One fell into the water due to eight-foot swells. The second SEAL dove into help. After a 10-day search and rescue operation, U.S. Central Command announced the service members had not been located. Officials say their prayers are with the SEALs' family and friends. We have another health update on Britain's royal family. Sarah Ferguson, the Duchess of York, has been diagnosed with skin cancer. Ferguson was treated for breast cancer last year and now was diagnosed with malignant melanoma and had several moles removed. Officials say the Duchess remains in good spirits and is doing well. Today would have marked the 51st anniversary of the Supreme Court's landmark decision on Roe v. Wade in 1973. However, in 2022, the decision was overturned after 49 years, leading to more abortion restrictions and bans. Over the weekend, women's rights marches took place all over the country, from Florida to Washington, D.C. Ariel Hickson spoke with protesters who braced the frigid cold to make their voices heard. The cold to turn you it off coming out? Absolutely not. These rights are necessary and they're needed for survival. We will come out in any weather. Hundreds of protesters took to the streets to get their voices heard. This year, abortion rights measures are on the ballot. It's a divisive topic that is bringing people from all over the country right here to march here in Washington, D.C. This passionate group of individuals are walking from here down to the White House. This year's theme, bigger than Roe. It's almost a little bit cathartic, right? When you get to yell out, hand bands off our bodies. It's been a year and a half since Roe v. Wade was overturned by the Supreme Court. The attack on abortion is definitely an attack on women of color and women who are like underrepresented because it's basically health care and basically you're robbing them of their fundamental right as an American citizen. 14 states have banned abortion. And according to the Guttmacher Institute, a research and policy NGO, the number of women traveling out of state for an abortion 
doubled in early 2023. In the Washington metro, women have access to an abortion in D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. But there's another side to the debate. Roll is done. Just Friday, anti-abortion rights marchers walked these same streets for the March for Life rally. I think it's very important for young people to come out and spread the message of pro-life. Yeah, like we're the next generation, so we need to do what we believe. That way our future is better. It's expected to be a hot topic for presidential candidates and their supporters. We're together in this. Regardless of what happens at the polls, we have a sense of unity no matter where we are. My choice! In Washington, My choice! Ariel Hickson, WUSA 9. More than 73,000 student loan borrowers are seeing $5 billion of their debt erased. The new round of debt cancellation affects public service workers like teachers, nurses, and firefighters. It's the latest smaller round of cuts from the Biden administration after the Supreme Court struck down a larger student debt relief plan last year. Overdraft fees, nearly one in five families wind up paying them each year, and they generate big profits for the big banks. But is the Biden administration putting a stop to that? Our national reporter, Casey Decker, verifies. When you make a purchase that sends your bank account into the negative, oftentimes your bank will cover the difference and let the transaction go through. But then they'll charge you a fee for that service, the overdraft fee. That fee is often $30 or more, even if the covered transaction was only a few bucks. Research shows banks make billions off these fees and that it's usually the poorest families paying them. But posts like this one claim the Biden administration is, quote, ending overdraft fees as we know them by capping them at as low as $3. So let's verify. Is the Biden administration capping overdraft fees at $3? Our sources are the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and the Truth in Lending Act. This claim needs context. The Biden administration is proposing to rein in overdraft fees, but the rule might not take effect for years and the cap might not be $3. Here's what we know. So far, this is just a proposed rule change, a modification to how the government interprets current law. Loans are tightly regulated in America, but right now overdraft services aren't legally considered loans, even though they consist of banks providing you money and expecting you to pay it back plus a fee. This proposal would change that, giving big banks two options. The first option, they can keep offering unregulated overdraft services, but they can't profit off them. That means the banks can only charge as much as it costs them to break even on the transaction, and they have to prove to the government how much it costs. Or they can just charge a pre-approved flat fee. That fee has yet to be determined. The proposal says it could be as low as $3, but it could be as high as $14. The second option, if they want to keep making profits from overdraft services, they have to treat them like a loan. That means following all the rules for loans, like disclosing the interest rate, which would allow customers to price shop. Rule changes like this require public comment before finalizing, and the administration doesn't expect the changes to take effect until October of 2025. That also means if Biden loses the election this year, the next president could simply stop this change from taking place. With your verify. I'm Casey Decker. Well, some good news to share for consumers as a cantaloupe salmonella outbreak is now over. The CDC says more than 400 people got sick in 44 states. The Malchita and Rudy brand cantaloupes were sold at a number of retailers, including Quick Trip, Kroger, and Trader Joe's. This was between September and December of last year. If you possibly put cantaloupe products in the freezer, the FDA says you should check to see if it was part of that recall. Call. And if you're not sure, just throw it away. Championship Sunday is now set. The teams competing next week for a trip to the Super Bowl are the Lions, 49ers, Chiefs, and the Ravens. It will be the San Francisco 49ers against the Detroit Lions for the NFC title. And right now, the Lions' storybook season is still alive as they advance to their first NFC championship game since 1991. Meanwhile, for the AFC title, it will be the Kansas City Chiefs traveling to Baltimore to take on the Ravens. Both games will take place next Sunday. May I have everyone's attention, please? We have a new student. What's up, Katie? Are you trying to make the rest of us feel dumb? I'm not trying to. It's just happening. Dear God, woman. 
In its second weekend at the box office, Mean Girls stayed on top and fetched $11.7 million. The Tina Fey scripted musical has now pushed its two-week total past $50 million, along with $16.2 million internationally. So far, it's outpacing the tally for the 2004 original Mean Girls. In second at the box office was the Jason Satham thriller, The Beekeeper, followed by Wonka, now six weeks into its run in the Theaters. Overall, it wasn't a big weekend at the box office with few options for moviegoers to choose from as this January stays on trend as a low time for going to the movies. You're all caught up. Thank you for joining us. I'm Joe Ellison.